Well, good evening, everybody. It's such a great pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, can I also join with Joe in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today? And can I do that in the context of great pride uh, at the role that Griffith University has played in uh, working with First Peoples and with educating at the moment, we have over a thousand Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students registered at Griffith University, one of the largest numbers in the country. Uh, and that includes people in every level of degree and in every one of our academic groups. Could I also acknowledge our panel who's here tonight and I know we're all looking forward to hearing from, so I won't delay you too long. It's so nice to see you all here in person. Now, a number of you said, of course, we wouldn't have had one of these last year, but we did, in fact. Uh, last year in February 2020, as we were all starting to say, do you think this China COVID thing could have relevance to Australia as well? Uh, we had an alumni event here and within a couple of weeks, it was the last uh, event that Griffith held for a very, very long time. So it was great, it was such a high quality one. And this is indeed our first alumni event post COVID that we are hosting outside of Queensland. So it's terrific to be able to join you here to do that. And we're even more delighted to be able to hold the event in conjunction with one of the great Griffith institutions, the Griffith Review, and in particular, edition 71, Remaking the Balance. The upcoming panel discussion will explore our relationship with nat natural capital, resources, profit and value to help us shape a more sustainable economic future post-pandemic. We're very lucky to have writer and journalist Gabrielle Chan with us to moderate this discussion and facilitate this important discussion. Gabrielle's book, Rusted Off, Why Australia is Fed Up, was shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Award and the Walkley Book Award. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Australia, The Australian and The Daily Telegraph, amongst many others. Gabby's joined on stage by Ken Henry AC, former Treasury Secretary, hardly needs introduction in a Canberra crowd, and Jane Gleeson White, adjunct lecturer at UNSW Canberra. And joining us virtually via Zoom from Melbourne, he had hoped to be here, but you will understand why he can't be, uh, is Alan Schwartz AM, the Managing Director of the Trawalla Group. Gabby, Ken and Alan were all contributors to the Remaking the Balance edition, which delved into our old and new ways of doing things, forging a new equilibrium to sustain the 21st century. Jane is a contributor to the upcoming Griffith Review edition and author of four books on economics and sustainability. It's going to be a really interesting panel. We're so grateful to everybody for being here, whether physically or virtually. Please join with me in welcoming Gabby to begin the panel discussion on this important and challenging topic. Thanks very much for that. Um, I will too acknowledge the traditional custodians. I've learnt a lot from uh, the local uh, custodians in my area and I'm hoping Jane will uh, talk a bit about her knowledge um, on that tonight. I'll, I'll crack on because we've had our introductions and I want to start with Ken Henry. Can you describe how a single tree had such an effect on you and, and how it showed up the inadequacies of the economic system? Yeah, oh, wow. <clears throat> yeah, I'll give this a go. Uh, I could spend an hour on this, but <laughs> look, uh, I, think I, was, um, I think I was about 10 years of age, something like that. My father, having uh, been a, um, a share farmer on a dairy farm that went broke when I was very young, uh, in a drought, of course, uh, on poorly managed land. Um, he went back to um, uh, life as a timber worker, um, cutting railway sleepers and, and then logs in various state forests in uh, the mid-north coast region of New South Wales, which at one time was the red cedar produ production capital of the world. Um, and, and so he was... Well, that's just what he was doing, was cutting logs in state forests. And one afternoon he came home in a state of excitement and he bundled up three boys where there's less than three years uh, in age um, difference among the three of us. He bundled us into the car, took us down to the sawmill and said, have a look at that. And what he was pointing at was a log that was sitting on the back of a, a timber lorry, you know, one of those big trucks. It could only fit one log. Um, that was the log that he'd cut down. Um, it was, I would say, two metres in diameter for most of the length of the log. It had no 
uh, pipe, this was the word he used, that means it had no hollow core, which was really unusual because it was a grey gum. And grey gums are renowned for having a big hollow pipe in them. And this is a bit of a problem for uh, timber workers because the, the local sawmills will only, and he was working for a sawmill, will only take into the mill logs, uh, trees rather, which um, have at least 30 centimetres of timber around the hollow pipe. And we, we stood there looking at this thing and then, you know, for some time, we were ooh, ah, wow, and the questions started flowing and I probably asked most of the questions. Um, at least that's how I remember it. <laughs> and and um, the questions are something like, well, how long did that take you to chop down, Dad? And how did you do it? And, and of course, it was a really dangerous thing that he did. And, and it did take him a long time, maybe half a day, to chop this thing down. And then questions like, well, hell, that must be, that must be worth a lot of money, Dad. Like, um, how many houses do you reckon that would build? And he was good with this stuff. Uh, he said, well, it's got X super feet of timber in it, which is something like cubic something or other. Um, I still don't understand what he was talking about, but he said it was X, cubic, uh, X super feet of timber in it. He said that would make the framing for probably three houses, three uh, timber houses or brick veneer uh, houses. We said, wow, you know, so th this must be worth a lot, Dad. Well, how much did you get paid for chopping this down? Because it was a few dollars. He was a timber worker, right? Didn't get paid much. Um, so where does the rest of the money go, Dad? Well, he said, this came out of a state forest. I think it was a Lansdowne state forest it came out of. And so um, that means that we have to pay some royalties to the state government. So this is the first time I ever heard about a royalty, was this conversation. Well, how much was that? Oh, that's a few dollars. Oh, that's a few dollars. So who gets the rest? Well, of course, the rest went to the timber mill and the timber mill owner. And, and then we started asking more questions like, well, um, so do you often, you don't often get logs like this. Oh no, but I've chopped down a lot of trees of this size. Really? So what happened to them? Oh, well, they all have big hollow pipes. Oh really? So where are they? Well, they're lying where I chopped them down, on the forest floor. Have to pay royalties on them? No. You only pay royalties on the ones you actually take out, take out of the forest. You know, I figured there was something wrong with this. <laughs> uh, this tree, like, he confirmed that the tree was several hundred years old. Um, it was the property of the people of New South Wales, at least I figured that much out from what he said. And um, he would got paid a few dollars for taking it out. The taxpayer, oh sorry, the, the people of New South Wales had received a few dollars in royalties. Yeah. And this amazing tree, um, which, um, well, no value. There was just no value uh, uh, if put on it by the government of New South Wales that actually went anywhere near um, its true commercial value, let alone its psychic value to people who enjoy the environment. And then there's all those hundreds of trees that he said he'd chopped down in state forests in that valley in his career, well, actually thousands, that were just left lying on the forest floor because it turns out after you chop them down, you inspect the, the pipe in them, the mill doesn't want them. Mm. What you call a bad economic signal. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think so. And that, and that, you know, looking back on it, that is, um, I'm absolutely certain that that's where my interest in economics and politics for that matter, um, but particularly in economics, that's where my interest was, uh, was born and there's no way, I'm, I'm sure there's no way I would have gone on to study economics but for that experience. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Alan, you've been a very successful business person and a very diligent philanthropist. Can you sketch out for us how you came to the conclusion that there were these two incompatible worldviews embedded in the economy? Uh, in your words, you've, you've written that capitalism is broken. Why? Uh, Thanks, Gabriel, and it's really very much connected to Ken's answer as well um, in the sense that I asked three very simple questions of myself. The first one is, why is it that we allow companies to profit when they destroy the environment or social cohesion? Why is it that um, 
uh, enterprise and businesses are not valued for the contribution they make to society? And why is it that not-for-profits who produce so much value um, struggle to get funded? And uh, the answer to that question fundamentally when you think about it is that value and profit, profit being how the economy works and value is the things that we value, are not aligned. And um, it was this realisation that actually led me to Jane's book, um, Six Capitals, which helped me then frame my understanding of what that meant because um, profit is financial capital, if you like, and everything else that we care about are the other capitals, as social capital and environmental capital. So as Ken says, you know, you can cut down a tree, um, you've harmed the environment, you haven't paid for it. Your profit is not a real profit because you haven't paid for the full cost of what it is that you've, you've sold. So um, just this afternoon, I started reading an amazing multi-hundred page document called, by a gentleman called Das Gupta on the economics of biodiversity. And this is a huge, huge thing in the world. So Jane's nodding, uh, Ken's nodding. This is really the zeitgeist, the fact that we've come to understand that whereas at the time of Adam Smith, you know, if you had, if you had a tree and you cut it down and you put up a house, no one would question the value of that house for people who had no houses. And there were lots of trees. But today we've got lots of houses and not enough trees. So everything's starting to change as we're starting to, if you like, get to the limits of what the, um, what the earth can support. And also, um, you know, other examples are, you know, Facebook had to pay for all the social dislocation that they're causing in society. Their profit wouldn't be anywhere near what it is. And, and, and the list goes on. So, um, Capitalism is broken and will be broken until that's fixed. I don't think it's impossible to fix, but it's got to be fixed. We've got to actually start measuring social and natural capital, um, and we've got to create the institutional structures to force uh, economic players to include the cost of those things in their transactions in whatever form. I mean, the case of climate uh, change and, and global warming, it's a price on carbon because it actually puts a price on an externality, if you like, a price on something that previously didn't have a price. That tree should have had a price that reflected its value to society, as Ken said. Price on carbon, that's a good idea, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Jane, how did you come to uh, your six capitals? I've, you started seeing accountants turning up at biodiversity conferences. You got onto this pretty early, though. Well, I personally didn't, but I read um, one of my favourite uh, journalists talking about the arrival in 2010 um, of accountants. So he'd been covering biodiversity co uh, conferences for you know several decades, and suddenly in 2010, there were the accountants, there were the money men, instead of the uh, you know environmental activists and the nature lovers, there were the men. Um, excuse me, I will just say men because I've been telling for ten years. And I just say the people, but um, there were the accountants and the and the numbers people. So I that really struck me because I had just spent three years thinking that I was writing about mathematics and the Renaissance and art, but realising that what was very... So I was interested in sort of the material history, and I realised that, that, kept, that the Renaissance came at the exact moment the double entry bookkeeping first arrived and was used in Italy. So that ended up in an investigation into accounting, which led me through the Industrial Revolution and the construction of the first national accounts you know, with Keynes and Roosevelt during the Depression and the Second World War. So by the time I got to finishing Double Entry, I realised what um, Alan and Ken realised, that there's this whole missing bit of value, oh, I like um, Alan's word, from our economy. And is my mic not working? Um, Use this one. Um, excuse me, everybody. <laughs> I hope everybody heard that. Um, so, yeah, I, so by that stage I had understood that accountants had been instrumental in every single moment of history from the invention of writing to the Renaissance, to the Industrial Revolution, 
and to the global economy as it was constructed following the Second World War. So when they started turning up at biodiversity conferences, I became very interested. And so I, I think of accountants as the people who are kind of at the interface between, well, one of the many people of the sort of um, material world and the world of metrics, which are used by economists to, you know, make their policy and governments. So when they, so if even the accountants, the most conservative, backward-looking group, by definition and pridefully so, proudly so, um, were now realizing that there was something really wrong with their system, that their system was broken, like capitalism was. And they're sort of like the gatekeepers of capitalism in many ways, because they're the people who calculate the profits, generate the GDP figures. Um, then this was something I needed to pay attention to. I wasn't anticipating writing a whole other book about it, but because I was travelling around the world with double entry, I was talking to people asking, you know, are we ever going to start accounting for these so-called externalities? And so many of them said yes, and we already are in all these different ways. And that was in 2013, so I realised that this was a whole new kind of movement. I call it a revolution, equivalent to the Industrial Revolution, equivalent to the Renaissance, yeah. So I arrived at the same position through a completely different path. So let's be very clear what we're talking about. We're talking about bringing the natural world onto the books. What's your short, sharp uh, definition of natural capital? Yeah, so what I found, well, for me, what I found travelling was already this pre-existing system that was just published in 2013, which attempted to make a framework to account for six capitals. So financial capital, as Alan mentioned, Manufactured capital, which was, you know, the capital, which is the value of plant and equipment, and then natural capital, social capital, human capital, intellectual capital. And natural capital is basically the value of the natural world. And it's sort of been extended and developed since its early um, definition in the 1960s, and now it extends to ecosystem services and all sorts of other things. But it is, you know, the carbon sequestration of forests. It is the, you know, the way that trees hold the soil together. It is the clean air. You know, it's every single thing. It's pollination of bees. It's every single thing that nature, so-called, does for us. You wrote in one of your essays uh, about a conversation with Carl Opst, who's the lead author and editor of the System of Environmental Economic Accounting, the SEA. Uh, which the UN has implemented now. Um, and, the, and the quote is this, here we reached a fundamental ontological disagreement. I believe the natural world exists for itself and has a right to exist regardless of human needs. Obst has an instrumental view of nature. We want to protect rivers because we need safe drinking water. Ken, what's nature for? Yeah. Just you know, we will. Question. So, so we will find out when it's too late, um, or maybe we'll start to find out when it's too late. So, uh, okay, but that word instrumental. That word instrumental is is quite important because there is actually a big divide um, in the way that economists, philosophers, uh, think about the concept of sustainability, according to the importance of instrumentality. So, for example, if you think of the early definitions of sustainable development going right back to the Brundtland report in the late 1980s, I think it was 87, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly. It talks about um, development which satisfies the needs of the present generation without jeopardising or compromising the needs of successive generations. To me, that is a hopeless definition of sustainability. Needs, for heaven's sake, economists categorise needs, and I learnt this in high school, as food, clothing and shelter. Is that all we're talking about? That provided we can provide sufficient food, clothing and shelter to successive generations of humans, then it doesn't really matter what happens to the environment? Well, I don't believe that. I've never believed that. I think that's just a complete nonsense. Um, to me, um, well, let me then put the question this way, the, or, or make this observation. So the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, uh, according to that metric, it had a negative value for the entire time that it existed or attempted to coexist with European settlers. And indeed, it did have a negative value according to the Tasmanian state government, but because for all but about six months of its existence or coexistence with European settlers, uh, the Tasmanian government had a bounty on its scalp of about, a, oh, it was a pound, it was exactly a pound, that's right. And that, that only ceased about six months before the last 
Tasmanian tiger died, fittingly in captivity through neglect. Um, and uh, many years later, the now extinct Bulletin magazine offered $1.1 million to anybody who could produce a photograph of one alive in the wild. So this question of what is the value mm. of nature and what does, uh, you know, how, how do you assess the value of nature and do you assess it according to its instrumental uh, importance, that is the contribution that it makes to uh, the production of other goods and services that people consume, or whether you place some um, different metric on the environmental value of that naturally occurring uh, thing, flora or mm -hmm. fauna, that is a really fundamental question, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and then you get to the questions of valuation. This is not straightforward. Even when you talk about natural capital, for most farmers when you talk to them about natural capital, if they understand what you're talking about, their concept of the natural capital is a private good concept of natural capital. What I mean by that is it's a piece of capital that they own, they control, and they can think about the value of it. If you think more broadly about the state of the natural environment, you're actually talking most probably about something which is a public good, not a private good at all. Uh, so when we sit here in this room tonight and I ask you to think about the value that you would place on the continued existence of the Tarkine Forest in Tasmania, every one of you would be capable of thinking about its value to you None of you owns it. It's not a private good. It actually has public good characteristics. If we were trying to put a value, a real economic value, on the continued existence of the Tarkine Forest in Tasmania, I would have to ask everybody in the world what value they placed on it, and I would have to add them up. And even that wouldn't be enough, because I would also have to ask all those people not yet born and there are many more of them than there are people in the world today. I'd have to ask them what value they'd place on it, right? These questions are never asked by decision makers. So with the Tasmanian government considering, I understand even today, whether to allow logging of the Tarkine Forest, they're not asking that question. They're not asking themselves what is the value to the Australian people, to the world, to future generations of this asset from which people derive, well, psychic benefit, obviously. And um, should we then talk about the really big problem, which is even if, it was, even if we could get everybody in a room and ask them what value they place on the continued existence of the Tarkine Forest, so we get 30 billion people in a room, let's say, and ask them that question, they'll give us a stupid answer. And the behavioural psychologists, behavioural economists, tell us that they will come up with a really stupid answer. Alan, you talked, uh, got together with ethicist Simon Longstaff and came up with the idea of universal commons. So is natural capital owned by no one or is it owned by everyone? And why, why do we have to own something? Why does, right. why, does something why does something in nature have to be owned by someone? A really great question because Initially, the concept of the universal commons was really a classification of all the things that, that are currently excluded that should be included. In other words, social cohesion, the environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I figured that if if no one owned it, um, we'd have what we've got today, which is a complete mess. Of course, not everything's instrumental. A love of a parent for their child can never be converted to anything instrumental, but there are certain things that can be measured and can, can have value for human beings. So the, the, the abstract theory was that if every one of those 30 million people, as Ken said, had an interest in the Tarkine Forest, perhaps I'd manage it better. Um, now, that was just an abstract idea in order to enable me to continue on my journey to say, well, what else would we need if these things were actually owned? The reality is that as I moved on, I realised that you know, I was making a bit of a, an assumption about uh, nature and um, I'm happy to admit 
that I'm a bit confused at the moment on that issue because it's a very, very difficult one. So my current position for what it's worth is that the worst outcome that we could have in relation to nature and social cohesion is that no one owns it. Um, a, better, a better option is that we all own it and manage it wisely for ourselves. And the best option is that we all own it and manage it wisely for ourselves and for those things as well. That's the broadest concept because they have rights, if you like, themselves. So I'm trying to be practical in, in a really difficult, in a really difficult set of questions and saying that in the world as we understand it, we don't seem to know how to manage things without some conception of property rights. Someone's got to own something for anything to happen. So that if you want to do it properly, we've all got to own it. But then you say, do we really have to own everything? And then we come back to your question, and I actually don't have an answer to it. It is confusing, mind-bending stuff, isn't it? And uh, Jane, I know you've been on a long journey with this. Where are you up to now with the concept of natural capital or any other capital? Well, um, well, going back to your question to Ken, which I think was a little more about um, the idea of nature as instrumental or having you know, an existence in its own right, because I think that's an interesting place to start. Um, so one, I'm still 100% that, I mean, because we are nature, like we're all kind of talking as if nature is something out there, but we are also nature. We're just a whole composition of bacteria and various other things. Um, so I think, you know, that's one very important thing to put centre, you know. So we're not even managing nature, we, we coexist with it and obviously farmers and other people genuinely manage it to a certain extent. So in terms of my conversation with Carl Opst, I can announce that in March the UN SEER, which is the system of economic or environmental and economic accounts, changed its view to align with my view. So it now does not define nature or the natural world as purely having value for its use for humans, but actually having an existence in its own right and not necessarily providing a benefit to humans and not necessarily being owned by anything. So this is why I sort of keep coming back to the accountants and to the system of economic, you know, the system of environmental and economic accounts and, and the new thinking that's going on there because it's really sort of advanced and sophisticated and constantly evolving conceptually and also methodologically. But also, you know, <clears throat> we are on a continent which has the most extraordinary, ancient, ongoing civilization, I think, anywhere on the planet, especially in terms of so-called sustainability. And there are, you know, indigenous, um, what shall we say, caretakers and um, knowledge holders of this land they, there was no sense of property rights as we understand it in the West. And this, this system predates any sort of, you know, property rights maybe evolved in ancient Rome and, you know, and, you know, there is a misunderstanding that agriculture necessarily involves, you know, the um, private ownership, which is not how Bruce Pascoe descri describes indigenous management in Dark Emu. So I guess my position, which is that nature has exists in its own right, I found sort of speaks to what has pre-existed here in terms of indigenous knowledge. So, you know, obviously I'm outside the bounds of what Ken and Alan are talking about to a certain extent, because I'm always pressing ahead to see. But, you know, I, I just feel that I, I would love that we pay more attention, as you have and so many other people have, to ways of indigenous management of land and their understanding that it is that we come second to nature. But is it just a philosophical argument really because you can say that nature has a right to be not owned by anyone else but the markets are moving aren't they Ken? The markets are pricing this stuff already. We're yeah. seeing that happen. What's happening around the world and where do you see it, it heading? Because there will be a price for, there's already a price for offsetting things, isn't sure. there? Is it merely a philosophical question? Well, does well, I mean, it, these are the big questions, right? The philosophical no, no, but, questions, but, are they? But, really does the it, but so, whether we decide yeah. nature has a right yeah, yeah, yeah. or not. So, so uh, here's the thing. Um, 
I don't have an issue with your framing at all. You know, I, I have one with yours either, Ken. I, I, think, <laughs> I, think that, um, I think it's incredibly important that humans face up to the reality that they are part of a system, you know, that they are natural beings themselves, part of a system. They're probably the only natural being that thinks it should be in control of the entire system. But with that comes huge responsibility, I would have thought. Um, and it's not obvious that as a species we are comfortable with that responsibility. We, we seem to want to shirk it at every responsibility. Uh, listening to Alan, you know, Alan, my answer to your question has always been government. That has always been my answer to your question. And having spent 28 years in government, though, I mean, your question, which is who should, if anybody, who should own the commons? I would say government should own the commons. It is the responsibility of government. For one thing, who else is going to protect us from the, um, the crazy decisions that we make with respect to uh, environmental assets. Um, anyway, all of our cognitive limitations, in fact. I mean, who else? It, it is for government, but I have to say to you, after 28 years of being in government, government hasn't been doing it. So, you know, but markets are developing. Markets are developing um, in a whole range, it's slow, but it is happening in a whole range of environmental assets because people are frustrated. Um, they, don't, they, they, uh, they don't like to see the environment being degraded and they are prepared to pay something, maybe it might not be a large amount for them, but they're, they're nevertheless prepared to pay something in order to prevent further environmental degradation. And over the years ahead, um, and not that many years, I'm pretty confident that we will see, even in Australia, <laughs> despite its history of unrelenting plunder um, of environmental assets, even in Australia, I'm pretty confident we will see a market in, let's call them uh, biodiversity certificates or uh, environmental condition certificates of one form or another. And I'm, I'm quite optimistic about that. I, I think this will happen. Now, the price at which those certificates trade will never provide an adequate reflection of the true value <coughs> of those environmental assets. But since the private owners where they exist, of those environmental assets, and many of them will be farmers, will be receiving some income stream from those instruments. It should provide a further incentive against further degradation of the environmental assets that are privately owned. So it's only part of the answer, but it is nevertheless, I think, an important part of the answer. And who knows what may come of it uh, once we venture down that path. Do we need government for that? Or do we, can it be done outside, given our history as well? Um, uh, yeah, I'm um, sorry. No. That's not a question to me. Alan, you, Alan <laughs> you don't want to answer it. Um, Alan, you talk about government, you know, we see our economic system as set in stone, that we can't change it. And the conclusion you come to in the in your Griffith essay is essentially, you know, the other capital that we haven't talked about, and that is political capital. Who is going to burn the political capital in order to get this stuff done? Is that the only yeah. way you see, see this happening, changing now? Yeah, look, that was my sad conclusion because throughout my life I've wanted to avoid politics um, because I always saw that as an ugly business. and. I felt that being in business, I could produce good quality products and services, look after my staff, pay my taxes and feel good about myself. But as I said before, the problem is that value and profit are not aligned. So a capitalist can't feel too comfortable with themselves when, when their businesses are producing carbon or doing other, you know, working in unsustainable ways. You can't blame business necessarily because unfortunately it's the whole system. And this is really my late onset political awakening, it applies. What happens is society 
we find ways of cooperating. Um, society keeps moving forward, economics keeps moving forward, new equilibriums are found. Those equilibriums favour certain groups in society who then hold on to those equilibriums as hard as they can and in fact claim that those things are the divine right of a king or the natural order of things and this is how economics works and we have capitalists who, 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 who see government involvement as, as red tape and, of course, they're taking for granted the education of their children and the roads and the fact that their, their uh, warehouses aren't going to be plundered by, by thieves, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they, they would like to have a set of rules that works just for them, but, you know, don't take it any further. And I think these arguments have been presented really well by Elizabeth Warren, the presidential candidate uh, for the last, uh, the last presidential uh, elections in America where she sort of described the self, the, the smug billionaire who thinks they've all done it themselves, but, you know, they rely on an educated workforce, roads that work, an internet that works, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And really the value that, that we rely on as a society and as business people are created collectively by government. And Mariano, Mariana Mazzacuto is also a wonderful explainer of the the role of government in creating technological advances, et cetera. So I think that it's um, that the, the natural order of things is, is a very dangerous idea and the natural order of equilibrium in economics, in neoclassical economics, is a, is a very dangerous idea. And the idea that we've got too much government in our society is a very dangerous idea because we need government, we do need good government, and government often disappoints us. But if you think about, you know, the carbon, the, the climate challenge, we really desperately, desperately need good government and we don't have it. And it's getting so bad that actually business itself is trying to lead. And it's really, really, really difficult as a business person to lead in areas where there's, um, if you like, uh, the problem of um, um, collective action really has got to be managed by government because businesses who lead often put themselves at disadvantage. Fortunately, we've got a conscious consumer base. The, 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 the community is becoming educated. Businesses can now move forward and be rewarded by their investors and by consumers for their actions. And slowly, one step at a time, we're inching forward and changing the framework of the way the, the environment, if you like, and carbon and the use of carbon. And eventually, this government will wake up and, uh, and start regulating properly rather than saying technology will solve it. But, of course, technology won't solve it unless the incentives are in place. So this concept of the natural order and things set in stone is, um, is a furphy. Jane, you've spent a bit of time in uh, New York boardrooms with hedge fund <laughs> managers and private equity dudes. Do you... The thing that worries me, I guess, is the capacity for creative accounting in order to get to, to uh, get a lot of revenue and t it might be 20 years down the track and we realised, oh, that habitat isn't actually there anymore or, you know, that water has disappeared. Where, where do you think the holes are in this system? What, what, what do you think... Um, we need to be aware of, I guess. Um, I think it was sitting <clears throat> with the hedge fund managers that completely destroyed any hope that I had in the possibility that this system might be ethical and might actually be for the benefit of, you know, the natural world and all the social goods that, um, all the social value that Alan talks about. Um, so, I mean, I feel that what Alan described you know, like the failure of government over the last 30 years is why hedge fund managers and private, you know, enterprise has stepped into, you know, the breach in responsibility for, you know, looking after these broader public goods. Um, I just, you know, I, I just remember one very sort of chilling example on Wall Street in 2016 where they, I was at a, a day-long conference, the first so-called sustainable um, sustainability conference of the New York Hedge Fund Roundtable, listening to a panel 
of like serious, big wig, huge, billion dollar wielding um, financial investment managers, um, you know, associated with the biggest names in town, as in Washington and New York. And they, they were sort of literally licking their lips and sort of rubbing their hands together over this new thing that they were calling blue gold. And I was sitting there kind of fascinated about this new opportunity investment. And it was only during the hour of listening that I, my heart sank and I just practically melted into the floor because they were talking about water. Mm. And they were talking about cornering the market in water and privatising water. And if anyone has read anything about what's going on in Flint, Michigan, or anywhere else in the United States where local communities can't access their water because it's all been bought up by Coca-Cola or Pepsi, then this is the future for me of natural capital because once you get the investors in, you know, so this was 2016. They were already geo-mapping the world in, you know, finding where the new supplies of fresh water was, were. And this was all in the name of sustainable development, sustainable for Pepsi-Cola, you know, Coke, uh, you know, so they could ensure for the long term, which is another buzzword, or the medium term, their supply of water for the next 40 years. So I just saw hell, actually. And I think that's what sent me, you know, looking for other ways of, of sort of articulating value of, of the natural world, which sent me to, you know, rights of nature and indigenous communities. And then in my most, re you know, my last Griffiths Review essay, they all ended up sort of meshing together, you know, in a terrible and possibly wonderful way. But yeah, I, I feel, I mean, I don't know what um, Alan and Ken think of that in terms of the opportunities, the miss, you know, like the, the negative opportunities once natural capital becomes some kind of fungible, financialized idea, you know, to, to use it as a means to just make money. Uh, <clears throat> so, look, I, it doesn't take much to get me pessimistic, right? So, um, <laughs> and you seem to have managed to do it pretty quickly. Um, but look, uh, I, I think there, there, there is at least, a, uh, there's at least a glimmer of hope. Um, yeah. Look, this stuff is fundamentally um, the role of government and, um, and by the way, Alan, every well-trained neoclassical economist understands that this is, and I am one, well, I'm a neoclassical economist, whether I'm well-trained or not, no matter, <laughs> but I, I regard myself as a neoclassical economist, but, um, uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure all neoclassical economists would say what we've been talking about is absolutely the role of government. Uh, and I reckon just about every one of them would admit, if only privately, government has not been playing its role. Um, I mean, ju just a little, little, little point on this. Uh, in the last few years in Australia, Milton Friedman's name has come up many times. He's a neoclassically trained economist. Uh, most misunderstood neoclassical economist in history, probably. Uh, I first read... He, he published a book called Capitalism and Freedom in 1962. I read the 20th edition of it in 1982, and I was blown away by it. Um, and it had a, had a big impact on me, but I, I lack humility, right? So I am I'm prepared to say to all of you that I think I understood it, unlike most people who seem to have uh, flicked through it and are happy to quote it. I don't think they do understand it. Um, he, he talks about democracy and business as being in a partnership. It's that partnership that establishes capitalism. Each has to play its role. Business has to play its role. Government has to play its role. You know what government's role is? Believe it or not, government's role is not to support business, it's to do the opposite, it's to control business. That is the role of government. He sets it out very clearly, you know, and, and people these days are fond of quoting Friedman on the purpose of the corporation as being to maximise profit. You know what Friedman says? He says that that is the purpose of the corporation and it should have no other social purpose. That is all it should do, provided it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, in free and open competition, absent fraud or deception. Those are the precise words that he uses. Is it the responsibility of business to stay within those rules of the game itself? He says, no, it's not. It is not. Business should maximise profit subject to the law of the land. It is your responsibility, the rest of us, he says, the rest of us, to elect people through a democratic process who will frame the laws and fund the regulatory agencies to ensure that markets are competitive, to ensure that consumers are protected from fraud and deception and so on. 
Later in the book, he talks about, although he doesn't use the word, he talks about ne negative externalities. He says that's government's responsibility as well. Same thing. Government has to establish the laws. It has to fund the regulatory agencies to ensure that business does not create negative externalities, right? He talks about the provision of public goods. Same thing. That is the role of government. Remember, when Friedman was writing Capitalism and Freedom, 1962, height of the Cold War, just one year before... Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, his big concern when he spoke about government was the government might do too much. The government would become a Frankenstein, that that's his word, that destroys the freedoms that we, that we want government to protect. I don't think, I'm sure it never occurred to him that government might do too little. But I reckon if he's in this room tonight, he would have to admit that that's actually what's happened. Mm. To go to Alan's point, it's not that government has done too much, rather, government has done too little. In his name, in Friedman's in, name. In his name, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, well put, yeah. If anyone would like to ask a question, uh, there is a microphone going around, um, so you can ask it now. Uh, I'll just ask one more question. So, so if you agree with Friedman on, on the corporate's role, that is just to maximise profit, what do you make of you know, the whole reason we're talking about natural capital partly tonight is because of the interests of corporations in natural capital. So, yeah, yeah. so is that... Yeah, no, yeah. it's a really good question. And, and, and I have thought a lot, <laughs> I've thought about this a lot. You know, I was not that long ago the chairman of one of the biggest companies in the country and asking myself that question. And I met with Alan in that role. You remember, Alan, we discussed this. Um, um, the thing is... Oh, and this is the reason for hope. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get back to the reason for hope. The reason for hope is this. Government is not playing its role. But people can see that government's not playing its role. And they're not comfortable with it. And the community, through various techniques, or various uh, devices... Please don't take offence that I've described you as a device, right? But journalists <laughs> are one of them. Yeah. Look... Shareholder activism, um, uh, through the general public just saying, this is not good enough, using the instruments at their disposal, uh, good journalists, um, social media, they are making it harder for businesses to do these things that you talk about, right? They are making it harder. Maybe it's not hard enough yet, right? But I've got a lot of confidence that the, that the, the younger users of social media are going to make it increasingly difficult for businesses to say, well, even though government's not playing its role, I still don't have to do any more than focus on profit. You can't get away with that as a senior business leader in Australia today, surely. You can't get away with saying, I only have to focus on profit, notwithstanding that government's not playing its role and addressing everything else. And my view is that business leaders, even today, and I think this is going to become more and more obvious as the years go by, but even today, business leaders are being held to account, increasingly, for all of the consequences of their corporation's activity, activities. It's got further to go, but we're well down the path, I think, and you, you've seen it um, with, um, you know, people having to, like I did myself as chairman of NAB, accepting accountability for something that I had no control over but nevertheless had to accept accountability for it because it just wasn't good enough. And you will see more business leaders accepting accountability uh, for, for similar things and for other things. Does that give you hope, Jane? Unfortunately not, <laughs> because that's, I guess, the rhetoric that Six Capitals engages with. Um, you know, there's this new idea of transparency and social media pressuring, you know, but, I mean, there's a good example. Um, Unilever was pressured into phasing out its use of palm oil, you know, cutting down Indonesian forests where orangutans are and so on and so forth, um, but which they are gradually phasing out except that it doesn't mean that the whole premise of Unilever, which is to 
maximise production of useless cosmetics to flood the markets of the world. That doesn't intervene in that whole logic, which goes back to the profit logic. I mean, it's very interesting that in the name of Friedman, you're kind of postulating the idea that corporations are going to take responsibility for something they have no legal obligation to take responsibility for, which is some kind of idea of social good or natural no, 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 I, environmental no, I, thing. No, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't saying that in the name of Friedman. Well, Friedman sorry, you're never... now ditching Friedman. No, Friedman would never... Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Just I'm saying, ditch I'm Friedman. Saying, what I'm saying is if Friedman was in this room tonight, he would say, I never should have written what I wrote in 1962. Oh, that is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Well, I came all the way to hear the best yeah. news. That gives me hope. Well, I'm sorry, yeah, because yeah, yeah. As I said, I mean, he was he was writing that in the shadow of the Cold War. Absolutely. He thought the big threat was socialism, right? Yeah. Um, then you know, socialism pretty much disappears. Turns out the big threat is not that governments are going to create a socialist society. It is that they're going to do too little, not too much. Alan, are you oh. going to get into politics to do too much? Yeah, well... Oh! Hmm. <laughs> it's interesting, because I am the capitalist and the private equity dude that you described before, so, but I'm not taking offence, <laughs> because I think... You can describe journalists however you like. <laughs> or randoms <laughs> like me, however you like. <laughs> But, but I think that the problem with Milton Friedman was he said that businesses must obey the rules, but we shouldn't have too many. That's yeah. where he was wrong. Yeah. He, he, he objected to any rules beyond property, property rights and a few other basic things. Well, you can't, you can't do that because capitalists will run riot mm. and uh, do exactly what they've done and exactly what they're doing. And they're human beings. They're flawed human beings like all the rest of us. And if you give them half a chance, they'll do the wrong thing. It says that the way we hold society together is through the rules that we collectively agree. So that the, you know, I have a very disparaging term for uh, private equity dudes and capitalists, of which I am one, and a business person, and an entrepreneur. And we, I call us reptilian optimizers. In other words, we're, we're relatively amoral. Um, we take the world as it is. And we try to seek to maximise outputs from inputs. That's what we do. We're like a machine. You get, you get a bunch of inputs, you get a bunch of rules, you get a bunch of constraints, and you're an optimizer. So the right business person is a person who says, I'm a reptilian optimizer. I think we should have as many rules as we possibly can to make sure that my profit is aligned with value that I create for society. I'm happy to accept that. And I think that's where business fails, where business says, this is red tape, this is getting in the way of my profits, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is helps to reconcile, if you like, Jane's view and Ken's view, um, bringing it together that a business deserves every cent of profit it makes uh, as long as it obeys the rules and it supports good rules and doesn't oppose good rules. So that a business that, that actually advocates, for example, for a carbon price uh, is, a good uh, is a good business, but the fact that a business cannot go carbon neutral today, you can't condemn them for that because they would go out of business today. But to say put a price on carbon, increase the price of carbon, is a, to me a responsible business person, mm -hmm. recognising that we need rules to protect ecosystems that we can't just do it through pricing, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think there's a reason to be uh, pessimistic. It's like throughout history, it's a struggle. It's a political struggle. It's a struggle of collective action. It's a struggle for mutualism, for cooperation, which we as human beings have done incredibly well for a long, long time. We keep on developing larger and more complex systems of cooperation than, than have ever existed, which is why we dominate the earth. So I'm an optimist, and I do think we occasionally screw things up really badly, and I'm really terrified about what's happening with, with climate. And I still meet people who are climate, climate deniers, which I find is completely beyond belief. Mm. Um, and I'm reading The Carbon Club at the moment, another thing I'm reading, which is a fabulous book about the, mm. the appalling um, behaviour of so many people in relation to you know, climate and carbon and carbon pricing. And I feel very, very strongly about that. But as, an, as a reptilian optimizer, 
<laughs> I'm starting to see opportunities to make money in low carbon solutions because the world is changing, mm. because behavior is changing, because technology is improving, because people are trying, because some governments subsidize and we struggle forward. Um, and I think that that's when a business person comes into their, into their, you know, into the best that they can be, which is trying to do good, finding opportunities to do things that are in the in social environmental value and profit simultaneously, but not at the expense of each other. So are you seeing a, an awakening amongst those um, fellow reptilian <laughs> optimizers? Um, are you seeing a, a, a sort of awakening and does it matter if they're doing it for to make more money or for moral reasons or to align the two halves of their soul? <laughs> it is so incredibly complicated. Some people are simply selfish and disinterested in others. Others are confused and don't understand how their behaviour is causing difficulty and, and others care and try to do the right thing, but struggle. I mean, if you ask me for all of our investments to go to net zero tomorrow, uh, because it's really important, I would say, you know, I can't do that. You've got to give me some time. And that's when you need government guidance. So there are some things that businesses cannot do, but, but they should not stand in the way of good government policy and they should not call it red tape and bureaucracy. They should embrace it and they should, they should accept it. So, yeah. <laughs> so are we moving into an era of big government again, Ken? There's been a lot of commentary oh, on yeah. that. Oh, I mean, we clearly are, but that doesn't in mean... In pandemic. That... Sure. That's kind of... So the problem here is that um, if the crisis is essentially existential or close to existential, so it's perceived as being imminent and everybody agrees that it's a crisis, then, of course, government will step in. Um, but it's, if the crisis is, uh, is um, described as something which is some years off, no. Mm -hmm. Complete lack of interest. Um, and that's been the problem with climate change. It's not only climate change. I mean, you know, shortly uh, the government will publish another intergenerational report. I led the development of three intergenerational reports. First one was in 2002. So this will be nearly 20 years later. Um, described, and I was careful with the words, it, it described a looming crisis 40 years away. We're 20 years in. How much action has been taken? Zero. Zero. That's the problem. So we'll see, yeah, I think we will see bigger government dealing with the here and now, the urgent, and um, I don't think we'll see without something much more profound Without a much more profound shock to government, I don't think we'll see bigger government dealing with the distant challenges, which tend to be the more important ones. Mm. And Jane, we'll end on you. Hope. What gives you hope? Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking with Alan, you know, I'm also an optimist, even though I might not sound, I'm just not necessarily optimistic about capitalism um, and the modifications we might make to it. But, I mean, what gives me hope is is just what I see on the ground, you know, all over the world, you know. So for me, my great interest now is not so much on the bigger system, but I'm still genuinely interested in it. But, you know, the initiatives that are taking place just bit by bit in small communities, doing the hard work. I also agree entirely with both of you, all of you, that it's a matter of government. It's a matter of bringing people together and making hard decisions. It's not a matter of just having metrics and, you know, whatever. I mean, that's good for accountability, but, you know, I mean, not to be, you know, just single out one poor young girl, but, you know, Greta Tumbo gives me hope. You know, I mean, I just think serious things are changing. The women's marches give me hope. I, I just think there's a whole new world mm -hmm. coming that's here and we ain't seen nothing yet. Mm. Right, great note <laughs> to end on. Thanks very much. I hope you'll thank our guests, uh, Ken, Alan and Jane. Uh, it's been a great conversation. I could stay here an all night and talk about it, actually. Thanks very much. Well, thank you uh, so much, Gabby. Wonderful questions. Uh, deceptively simple in some cases. You might, yeah, what's nature for? <laughs> very shortened to the point, but not, not so straightforward. Uh, and this is just exactly the sort of thing Griffith University, uh, including through the wonderful Griffith Review, wants to do to get people with great 
different backgrounds, disciplinary expertise from people who can channel the ghost of Milton Friedman to reptilian <laughs> optimists to people who've been in the room when the, the uh, stealing of the world's water has been uh, worked through. Get them talking about the big important questions, the issues that are really important for our time. So can you join with me once again in thanking our panellists for a great conversation tonight. <laughs>